please, uh, please come in, find a seat. We're about to begin. Welcome to the concluding lecture of our fall lecture series. Uh, just a reminder for AI credits for continuing education. Um, if you'd like credit for those, you can sign up for those at the sign up sheet uh, at the desk in front. Um, so tonight's our last lecture for the fall series. We have with us our newest uh, member of the faculty, Vanessa Grossman, who has uh, just joined us as a product of an intense history and theory search last year. Uh, her title of her lecture is, Does Architecture Speak Politically? Aggiornamento, Representation and the Global History of the Cold War. Vanessa has recently joined the faculty of Weissman School of Design as an assistant professor in history and theory architecture. She's an architect, historian, and curator. Her work addresses the intersection of architecture with ideology, housing, and governments, with a special focus on global practices in Cold War era Europe and Latin America. Prior to joining the Weitzman School standing faculty, Grossman was an assistant professor at the Faculty of Architecture and the Built Environment at Delft University of Technology. She held a postdoctoral fellowship at the Center for Advanced Studies in Architecture of the Swiss, Architecture, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. She has also taught at Princeton University uh, uh, School of Architecture, the National School of Architecture of Versailles, and the University of Miami. School. Uh, in addition to the School of Architecture, the Burr Logger Center, and the Advanced Studies in Architecture and Urbanism and Design. She holds a BA from the Faculty of Architecture and Urbanism at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, and an MA in the History of Architecture from Paris, one Pantheon uh, Sorbonne Department of Art and Architecture, uh, Archaeology, and an MA and PhD in History and Theory of Architecture from Princeton University School of Architecture. Quite a lot of degrees there. Uh, Assistant Professor Grossman will present a preview of her forthcoming book, A Concrete Alliance, Communism, and Modern Architecture in Post-War France, which looks at how political communism and architectural modernism become mutually reinforced ideologies during France's Fifth Republic, circulating across networks of architects, civil servants, intellectuals, activists, and politicians. On the eve of May 1968, the seemingly monolithic character of the French Communist Party, the PCF, which ran the risk of appearing authoritarian or totalitarian, was aesthetically softened by the idea of architecture as a mirror. The metaphor was well suited to the dualistic, dialectical, and divided mentality of Cold War, which gradually gave way to an internal split between the hardline Cold Warriors of the, PS, uh, sorry, the PCF and the Vanguard, which favored a, uh, which favored a sorry, which favored a thaw and a giornamento updating. This Italian term refers to the Western movement to re redefine the global positions of Marxism and communism, which ran parallel to ecumenical efforts to reassert the global position of the church. This lecture will examine the commissioning of the Brazilian architect Oscar Niemeyer to design the new PCF headquarters in Paris from 1965 to 1980, the iconic concrete and mirrored glass building that came to represent this aggiornamento. Great. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Vanessa. Thank you so much. Um, it is a gr it's too tall. Oh. Can I put it down a little? Yeah. So it's a, it's a great pleasure and a true honor to be here to share my work with you, especially considering that this is the last lecture in the Weizmann School of Design Department of Architecture lecture series for the fall 2023. I'd like to thank everyone who has made this lecture possible and promoted it, especially Andrew Sanders, Michelle Sanders, and Mich Michael Grant, as well as all of you who are attending. 
This is also an opportunity for me to introduce myself to the larger Weizmann community of great colleagues and students that I have been fortunate enough to join as assistant professor of the history and theory of architecture since the beginning of this academic year, so that we can potentially continue or begin fruitful dialogues and collaborations. And I'm very happy to see some of my students who have been kind enough to join us tonight and make this talk even more special for me. What I will present today is a preview of my forthcoming books, as Andrew said, entitled The Concrete Alliance, Communism and Modern Architecture in Postwar France, which is under contract with Yale University Press with the support of the Graham Foundation and the Princeton University Bar Free Publications Fund for an English edition and with the Edition de la Villette for a French edition, both to be published in 2014-24. So in my talk, I will first walk you through the general argument of my book. I'll then use it as a means of connecting to other projects related to this research and to my work in general. In the third part of my talk, I'll discuss the third chapter of a concrete alliance in the form of a lecture entitled, as Andrew uh, mentioned, Does Architecture Speak Politically, Aggiornamento, Representation, and the Global History of the Cold War. Um, so to introduce my work, a few more clarifications. Uh, I'm a Brazilian architect, historian, curator. Uh, I have worked uh, in, uh, well, in three continents uh, with the goal of contributing to a deeper understanding of the intersection of architecture and politics, ideology, governance, housing, and the struggles for social justice and equity, which we have come to understand cannot be separated from environmental justice. My research interests seeking to collab contribute to a global history of the Cold War have ranged from local municipal communist governments in social democracies and their housing plans to the megalomaniacal projects of military dictatorships in what we now call the Global South. I have translated this interest into academic teaching, publications and exhibitions in educational institutions and curatorial venues worldwide. My work has covered multiple geographies and how they are connected. For example, I have researched how Dominican priests in France push the agenda of architectural modernism and modern art by looking at pioneering modern German churches built out of rubble during post-World War II reconstruction. I was interested in the parallels between Western communism and Catholicism, two of the major ideologies of the 20th century and how their proponents felt that both needed updating, so in Italian, aggiornamento, in the face of their post-war decline and how this renewal had a material and direct spatial implication, especially after the mid-60s. In France, this Italian term has been used by historians and by members of the French Communist Party themselves to describe the process of renewal initiated by the French communists, which I analyze in my book. I also studied the transatlantic exchange between France and Brazil through the work of Oscar Niemeyer, which was largely facilitated by the French Communist Party, as I will discuss in a few slides. After largely dismissing the significance of communism for architecture, architectural history has, in the two last decades, explored the topic by uncovering the long-neglected production of post-war European, uh, Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. In the process, Western Europe's own architectural legacies of communism have continued to be neglected and obscured. My forthcoming book seeks to correct this omission as a comprehensive study that offers a new perspective on the relationship between architecture, presentation and politics in the Cold War. A concrete alliance examines the long-standing collaboration between modern architects and, and the PCF, one of the most important Western Communist parties of the 20th century. The book begins at the height of the Cold War in France's urban expansion in 1958, when the Algerian War of Independence against French colonial rule brought General de Gaulle back to power to establish the French Fifth Republic, which lasts until today. It ends, my book ends, with the irreversible fall of the PCF in the 1981 French presidential elections. The book examines in great detail the party's architectural program during this period. The book thus covers about two decades of architecture and urban history, during which this collaboration found its fertile ground in the industrial peripheries of France's major cities, the so-called banlieue rouge or red belt. Successively re-elected French communist mayors and officials 
attempted to build at the municipal level almost a state within the centralized welfare state established by General de Gaulle. Uh, de Gaulle actually came back to, to power in France, as I mentioned, in 58, at the apogee of a period known as the Glorious Thirty, what marked France's unprecedented urbanization. As these architects of the concrete alliance became more involved in the governance of the city, the communist utopia was soon confronted with local action and the management of the urban space. They, were, they promoted architecture as a mode of spatial and ideological control, transforming cities into veritable communist bastions that provided the party with its most solid electoral base and much of its cultural identity. The proliferation of social facilities combined with affordable housing contributed to this end, helping to program the city around a particular communist lifestyle. New architectural typologies helped propagate the belief that communist society had been realized at least on a small civic scale. The book's main argument is that in France, political communism and architectural modernism were mutually reinforcing ideologies that circulated through national and international networks of modern and revisionist architects, party officials, local governments, students and activists of the youth and women's movement, and the theorists and philosophers who conceived, designed, built and critique the projects analyzed. Although the period was marked by the gradual decline of both communism and modern architecture, by forging a common path, the main actors of the book paradoxically experienced a new freedom to experiment in both form and social programmatic content and to imagine a future that presented an alternative to the dominant model of Western capitalism. The book calls this historical opportunity a concrete alliance, a term that attempts to unravel the various meanings of concrete, from a building material to the material existence of ideology. The term alludes to the concreteness of architecture as a political tool, to the brutalist idiom of reinforced concrete buildings that were designed under disarrangement, and to the way ideology, and I quote, interpolates concrete individuals into concrete subjects that prescribe material practices, to borrow from the French philosopher Louis Althusser, one of the intellectual protagonists of the stories, who also sought to update both Marxist, Marxism and French communism. The alliance identified in this book was by no means primarily about buildings, which ranged from the aforementioned public housing and social institutions to party headquarters, urban renewal master plans, and ephemeral architecture. It also unfolded in social relations, political discussions, events, and printed ephemera such as L'Humanité and La Nouvelle Critique, the party's daily newspaper, which still exists, and Intellectual Monthly, which no longer exists. Here in 1972 is a discussion of the temporary architecture of the today Fête de l'Humanité, a political, cultural, and musical festival that is still sponsored by the party's daily newspaper. So the Fête de l'Humanité just happened this year and it still attracts hundreds uh, of thousands of people uh, to the Paris uh, Beaulieu. So the protagonists of a concrete alliance were at the front forefront of the campaigns carried out together with the most progressive wing of the party in an attempt to update the agenda of modern architecture and communism in the face of the rise of postmodernism and the so-called radical left. The new political formations of the radical left were partially an outgrowth of opposition to the Algerian War of Independence from France. So we have to recall that after being a French colony from 1830 to 80, 1848, Algeria was part of France from 1848 until its independence in 1962. The rhetoric and program of the radical left that emerged in France in the 60s were fueled by French structuralism and urban sociology. They shaped the events of May 68, which were a watershed for both French communism and modernism. In France, postmodern architecture uniquely merged with radical leftist ideas. The new perspectives on the city promoted by the new French socialist left after 68 challenged modernism and communism as authoritarian ideologies. Discourses of cadre de vie, that is everyday life and the city, identity politics and ecology were among the main strategies of the political program of the new socialist left. The revisionist protagonists of a concrete alliance appropriated some of these strategies 
in order to prove the ability of modernism and communism to endure while compromising in significant transformations. Here, for example, the poster for a post-68 national conference on urbanism organized by the PCF, depicting students hand-in-hand -hand with workers from a series by the painter Fernand Léger, long a member of the Communist Party. The book also contributes an archaeology of the current crisis of the banlieue, where many of the housing projects it discusses are being questioned or even dismantled. Two developments have defined this crisis, which is itself linked to the fate of the French Communist Party since the 80s. The first was the general deindustrialization of that closed factories in the Red Belt. The second was the retreat of laid-off workers and the arrival of immigrants, mostly from former French colonies in Africa, who filled their apartments. The party's message often failed to resonate with the newcomers. The war that France fought in Algeria, which cleaved French society, is the formative event that serves as the anchor for the internal chronology of this book. One of the aims of the book, then, is to assert the centrality of colonialism and empire to post-war developments in communism and modern architecture, including even those located in France. A concrete alliance builds on a growing number of studies that take networks of actors rather than individual architects or clients as their subject matter and emphasizes the role of female protagonists in post-war France. In a general context of underrepresentation of women, both in architecture and political parties, the French Communist Party stood out in France as the major political party with the most feminine militant base. Focusing on key episodes, the book examines the work of the members of the Atelier d'Urbanisme et d'Architecture, known as the AUA, AUA, pioneering interdisciplinary cooperative of architects, planners, economists, geographers, engineers, interior designers, and landscape designers that architectural critics and historians such as Jacques Lucas have described <clears throat> as representing a brutal, brutalisme à la française, or French brutalism. The book examines the opportunistic way in which the discursive channels of political activity were used to present a more or less established architectural idiom, brutalism, as novel, exciting, and even, even revolutionary. Within the context of ideologically driven discussions of socialist realism and the legacy of historical avant-gardes, largely bled by Anatole Kopp, who was a member of the PCF since the eve of World War II, Cobb played a major role in, Western dissemination, in the Western dissemination of Soviet architecture beginning in France. The book covers several iconic architectural projects, including the headquarters uh, of the French Communist Party in, in, in Paris, designed by Brazilian architect Oscar Niemeyer in collaboration with designers of his generation, such as Jean Prouvé, and a handful of younger French architects, some of them members of the Atelier d'Urbanisme et d'Architecture. After the military coup in Brazil in 1964, Niemeyer went into exile in France because he was an open communist. Thus, a concrete alliance intersects with the fate and international networks of Brazilian modernism, especially after the Cuban Revolution, which polarized opinion in Latin America and fed into the Cold War divide. Niemeyer has also designed lesser known projects in France. The book also situates these projects in the shifting political discourses of the era. And it also draws attention to some architectural masterpieces that have been under, undeservedly overshadowed by the rise of postmodernism in France. These include buildings designed by Jean Renaudi and René Gayusté, a rare woman architect of her generation who sadly died in Paris in the beginning of this year, in January, and I actually spoke about her work when I came from my, um, my, my former lecture um, uh, in, the, in the spring. So Gayusté devoted her life to designing housing in the suburbs, most notably as the chief architect of Ivry-sur-Seine, an eastern Paris suburb considered to be the capital of French communism. Le Monde's obituary emphasized that Gayusté was one of the first women in France to set up her own architectural practice. Here, Gayusté is featured among male architects such as Paul Chemetov, a founding member of the Atelier d'Urbanisme et d'Architecture, and even a young Jean Nouvel, who, according to an editorial in a 1987 issue of L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui, wanted not only to design housing, but to reinvent the world. 
In 2020, I contributed a few essays to a thematic issue of the Swiss architectural magazine Werk, Bau and Wohnen, dedicated to the largely overlooked work of René Gayusté in Ivry-sur-Seine. Um, the study that led to the conception of a concrete alliance was a journey of several years, during which I delved deeply into a lesser known facet of Western communism, exploring how architecture and politics influenced each other through extensive primary research in a wide range of archives inside and outside France, as well as extensive interviews with key protagonists, including Gayusté herself. But I have also pursued some of the, of the research themes that led to this book through other projects and modes of knowledge transfer. My motivation to focus my teaching and research on contemporary culture, social, societal impact and public action has led me to develop a collaborative curatorial practice linked to educational programs around the world. My scholarship on France led to my appointment as assistant curator of modernity, promise or menace. The French pavilion at the 14th architecture exhibition of the Venice Biennale, which some of you may have visited an edition of the Biennale curated by Rem Kuhas. Our French pavilion received a special mention from the jury. At the center of the pavilion was the architectural model of Villa Arpel, the automated modern house that was the protagonist of the famous Mon Oncle by Jacques Tati, uh, which I have discussed with my students this semester in 611. Scenes from the film were projected as a kaleidoscope, along with many films about French modernization, as the result of an in-depth research conducted by the curatorial team at the French National Audiovisual Institute. We worked together with the French director, producer, and scriptwriter Thierry Van Damisch. I was also co-curator of Une Architecture de l'Engagement, an architecture of engagement, La UA, at the Cité de l'Architecture et du Patrimoine in Paris. While the French pavilion explored the apores of modernity and modernization in France, against the backdrop of nationalism and in relation to current debates on globalization. The exhibition in the, at the Cité de l'Architecture expanded beyond the monograph to explore the relationship with culture, technology, engagement, and governors, go governance over a quarter century of the AUA, the cooperative that is at the center of a concrete alliance. Both the exhibitions and the accompanying catalogues, which we have conceived as edited volumes, featured projects that are analyzed in my forthcoming book, such as the steel panels and curtain walls. Um, I forgot a slide, it's here. And curtain walls designed by Jean Prouvé, Niemeyer's headquarters of the PCF, and projects by Gaiusté and Renaudy. Uh, the catalog of the French Pavilion presented one milestone architectural project per year, reframe, reframing colonialism and modernity. I have also researched and published extensively on the fate of modern architecture during Brazil's Cold War-driven military dictatorship. I was the first Latin fellow in architecture of the Princeton University program in Latin American studies when I was researching the dissident work of left-wing groups that were emerging at the time, such as Arquitetura Nova, which critically discussed the division of labor in architecture and the emancipatory potential of the construction site. Their work was largely informed by the agendas of Brazilian communist dissident and urban guerrilla fighter Carlos Marighella and of Brazilian radical educator Paulo Freire, as well as by French structuralism. I have researched student-led publications of the time in the 60s, such as Desenho and O, uh, which were published uh, in the 60s at the University of Sao Paulo, where I studied myself in the 2000s. And my own, this was my own contribution to uh, Clip, Stamp and Fold, which, uh, with which many of you may be well acquainted. Um, I also studied the ambivalent positions and projects and the voluntary exile of Oscar Niemeyer in France after Brasilia, which I mentioned before, when he designed uh, the headquarters of the French Communist Party but also the headquarters of the French car manufacturer Renault. And at, ta at a time when Renault was actually, uh, uh, well, the communists were organizing strikes against Renault. In those years, around 68, Niemeyer also became the architect of the Algerian Revolution when he was commissioned by Algerian President Houari Boumediene to forge a modern nation newly independent from France, an independence not immediately welcomed by the French communists. So this is another book project on which I'm working, uh, dedicated to the French Communist Party headquarters. 
I also researched the work during the 60s of Italian-born Brazilian architect Lina Bobardi and her interest in, interest in everyday life. My research on the history of contemporary architecture in Latin American modernisms led to my appointment through a first ever international competition as co-curator of the 12th International Architecture Biennale of Sao Paulo, which took place in two major venues, the Centro Cultural Sao Paulo, a city-run public cultural center, which you can see um, on the image uh, on the top, uh, designed by, in the early 80s, in the end of Brazilian dictatorship by Eurico Prado Lopes and Luis Telles. And in the image below, the SESC 24 of May, the last design built in Sao Paulo by the recently deceased Brazilian Pritzker Prize laureate Paulo Mendes da Rocha, a building visited by 10,000 people every day. Titled Todo Dia, Every Day, the Biennale sought to explore the new protagonism of the notion of everyday life in 21st century architecture. This theme is the result of my research building on this concept of everyday life, which has traversed architectural culture since the historical avant-garde and has been at the center of architectural, political, and sociological debates in post-war France, as well as in Bobardi's work. Todo Dia argued that many designers today have expanded their focus beyond the built form to include banal objects, food and basic resources, instances of race and gender, daily routines, and maintenance protocols how they deal with major social issues such as the Anthropocene through the tangentiality of everyday life. Its program and featured works lay emphasis on the Global South, attempted to reimagine how these uh, uh, foci can respond to a world reaching an overbuilt capacity where yet where millions remain homeless and lack rudimentary infrastructure. The, the Biennale opened... Um, here are a few of the works, but I think I inverted the, the slide. So the Biennale opened just a few weeks after Sao Paulo was darkened by smoke from forest fires in the Amazon forest and the cloud. And among the participants was our professor at Weizmann, Fernando Lara, whose work uh, with his students titled The Destructions of the Environment Every Day featured the minerals that make up the iconic buildings of the 20th century. The architectural models on display were filled with mud from the sites of Brazil's environmental crimes. And I want to go through a few of other works, uh, Bruder, um, Eli Mosaieb, Elio Menezes, and Wolf Architects from South Africa, Ana Mijaki from um, MIT, uh, she was uh, also part of the open call. And architect Andres Haque, Dean of the Columbia Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, was not only our keynote speaker, but also participated with a new work he commissioned from his Office for Political Innovation. We asked uh, him for an intervention on the glass facade of SESC 24 of May that will deal with its daily maintenance. And Haki and his team came up with a video installation, which we projected in the waiting room of the SESC Dental Clinic entitled Architecture as Ultra Clear Rendered Society, asking how, for whom, and by whom the facade of SESC is maintained. The Graham-funded book, Everyday Matters, Contemporary Approaches to Architecture, a spin-off from the Biennale, came out last year. And in my current position as assistant professor at Weizmann, my teaching has been geared towards providing research methods, theoretical tools, and historical precedent to both undergraduate and graduate students on topics related to Todugia. I'm also particularly interested in issues related to affordable housing, in view of an even national process of economic development in the global south and the role of processes of internal colonization largely framed by new intersectional approaches. In my former position as assistant professor at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands, I co-organized an open call for PhD proposals through which we selected a candidate working on rural housing in the Venezuelan Amazon during the Cold War as well as a few lecture series, such as Decolonizing the Global in the Era of Climate Change. I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to pursue these investments at Weizmann with my colleagues, Professor John Oakman, Daniela Fabricius, and Fernando Lara, through the mini lecture series we co-organized this fall and will continue in the spring, to which we invite you all. I also co-organized through a partnership between Delft University of Technology and Het New Institute in Rotterdam, the 2021 edition of the Bakema Conference on the Architectural Uses of Ethnography, focusing on both past and contemporary architecture practices and discourses, 
and building on the theme of the Biennale and the Everyday Matters book. I also began to develop a research project on architecture and planning during the Brazilian so-called economic miracle, the modernization wave of the 60s and 70s under the rule of the Brazilian military government in the Cold War, with a focus on the urbanization of the Brazilian Amazon. The research has an autobiographical component, as I spent part of my childhood in the early 80s in Carajás, the world's larger, largest iron ore mine, a project initiated by the Brazilian military in the Amazon. And you cannot see me, but I'm here um, as a child in Carajás, in a thematic issue I co-edited uh, for the Zurich-based journal Delphi. And I'm very excited to continue this work through an elective course that I'll, will be offered next spring at Weizmann for master students focusing on the architecture, landscapes, land use planning and infrastructures of Amazonia. The idea is to put together an exhibition that raises important considerations about the relationality of humanity in coexistence with other life forms, cultures, ecologies and ancestral, ancestral way, ways of life. I thank Catherine Sivit Nordenson, Andrew Sanders and Fernando Lara for their support of this course. And this is also meant to appeal to students who are interested in thinking about where they stand regarding climate change. And I began to develop this research project on Amazonia in conjunction with a major retrospective of the work of Paulo Mendes da Rocha, the architect of the SESC 24 of May that I showed you earlier. Uh, I was commissioned to co-curate this exhibition, which opened in May 2023 at the Casa da Arquitectura in Portugal, the institution to which Mendes da Rocha polemically donated his archives. And I say polemically because the archives moved from a former colony, Brazil, to a former metropolis, Portugal. In my teaching, I tried to share my work and experience as a curator with my students. Last spring, I had the opportunity to engage my students at the Berlage, a post-professional program that is part of TU Delft, in a theoretical seminar in which they wrote papers and designed amazing conceptual sectional models for the exhibition. So here you can see in the picture in the middle, Portuguese architect Eduardo Soto de Moura, also a Pritzker Prize winner, who is the designer of the exhibition, sketching his project for the Braga Soccer Stadium, uh, surrounded by my students when we visited it during the exhibition opening, which my students were also uh, an important part. And this pedagogical experiment was also an opportunity to discuss with them the epistemologies of architectural archives. The exhibition aims to consider Mendes da Rocha's work within his geographic approach to the Americas, emphasizing the complex relationship between nature and culture that runs through his work and his passion for water, including the waters of the Amazon River Basin. Um, so his, these are the, my student models that you could see in the previous slide. And I would like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to the co-curator with me of this exhibition and others other exhibitions I have shown to you before, the preeminent French historian and curator of architecture, Jean-Louis Cohen, who was the Sheldon Solo Professor of the History of Architecture at the New York University Institute of Fine Arts. Jean-Louis Cohen has written, taught, and curated groundbreaking books, courses, and exhibitions on a wide range of topics in geographies in modern architecture, urbanism, and design. Uh, he's also protagonist of my forthcoming book, a Concrete Alliance, as you probably could have seen in some of my slides, and he was my dear professor, doctoral advisor, mentor and friend, and he tragically passed away, in fact, the day I landed in Philadelphia uh, in August. M among many other things, Jean-Louis Cohen taught me everything I know about making books and architectural exhibitions, which, as he used to say, are the spatial construction of a statement or the deployment of knowledge in space. But above all, he taught me that exhibitions are an opportunity to produce knowledge that goes beyond the show itself, including the creation of new objects, such as architectural models, books, educational activities, from courses to symposia. They are an occasion to mobilize intelligences in local and international communities, architects, graphic designers, filmmakers, students, colleagues, cultural and political institutions, their agents and publics, in order to promote and preserve architecture as one of our highest cultural forms, the one in which we live. And I'm really beyond grateful. Next Friday, one of his latest books published by MIT Press will be presented at Weizmann by the co-editors with Jean-Louis Cohen, and I hope that you can join. 
and I am in the process of completing the very thick forthcoming exhibition catalog that I organized, I co-organized with Jean-Louis Cohen, a lavishly illustrated edited volume, volume on the seminal work of Paulo Mendes da Rocha that I hope uh, to launch at Weizmann in the spring of 2024, also as a tribute to Jean-Louis Cohen. And from Porto, I will take you to Paris, more specifically to Belleville, to delve into the third part of my talk. which points to a larger trajectory in which the material culture of the Cold War persists in our time, particularly in relation to the current ideological turmoil in liberal democracies worldwide, including the fear of alleged communist conspiracies and anti-communist attacks that we witnessed in Brazil in January of this year, or last year, when the current president Lula was elected. Attacks that, of course, have a timely precedent in this country, where former President Trump says America is fighting communism and socialism at home, and where the former president of Brazil appears to be in exile at the time. Um, in fact, uh, when this happened, Bolsonaro came to the States, as you, some of you may know. So in 2020, the Atlantic spoke of how, and I quote, the ghost of the Cold War haunt politics in Brazil, the world's fifth most populous country. He pointed to, quote, a lineage of right-wing conspiracies that have threatened Brazil democracy since the 30s. And of course, in its lineage, Brasilia set an ambiguous precedent as the headquarters of a democratic power that became the headquarters of a military dictatorship but also as an outpost or entry point for the construction of projects in Western Brazil, particularly in the Amazon forest. But does architecture speak, speak politically? This was the title of a debate published by La Nouvelle Critique in 1974 in an issue that also discussed, among other, other things, 10 years of dictatorship in Brazil. It was a conversation between Anatole Kopp, Jean Renaudi, and Paul Shemetov, a, found, a founding member of the aforementioned cooperative, the AUA, and a very young Jean-Louis Cohen. This question referred to a kind of architectural identity crisis among the architects associated with the French Communist Party. This crisis was somehow caused by the fact that the French capitalist welfare state had blunted the revolutionary edge of the communists by appropriating both the architectural typology affordable mass housing, and the aesthetic modernism that were once the staples of left, leftist politics before the rise of Stalinism, of course. Three years earlier, in 1971, the same publication, which was the political and cultural monthly of the French Communist Party, published a special dossier in September as a supplement to its 46th issue. This 34-page document was dedicated to the latest achievement of the party, the completion of the first phase of the construction of its national headquarters called the House of the Communists. The party's office had until then been spread out among various buildings in Paris. By centralizing and modernizing it as a workplace, this new building would give the PCF a new physical presence in the capital, notably by making it a point of attraction and tourism in the traditional working class district of Belleville. The building would house the national headquarters of the party, including all its organs, and a conference hall for the electorate and members of the party's provincial branches. Oscar Niemeyer, known in France at the time as the man of Brasilia, who was promoted, and I quote, against the architecture of cubes, was commissioned to design this building, one of the most important in his long career, in collaboration with Paul Chemetov and Jean Desroches, then younger French architects, also members of the Communist Party, and the French constructor Jean Prouvé, who designed the building's mirrored glass facade. Prouvé's mirrored facade, which became an iconic synagogue for both the building and the party, was featured on the cover of La Nouvelle Critique's dossier. For the PCF, the facade symbolized its commitment to a process of renovation that I already mentioned before, aggiornamento, which was a reference uh, to the processes that took place um, in the Roman Catholic Church. The following year, in 1972, when the headquarters was unveiled to a more professional audience, the architectural press inevitably referred back to La Nouvelle Critique's dossier. For the architectural review, Niemeyer's discourse was unashamedly propagandistic in tone. The implication was that the party's political agenda was inherent in the building itself. But if modern architecture was a political instrument, what exactly was its ideological content? It's, is architecture itself political? 
Can architecture speak politically? As Shemitov, Renaudi, Kopp, and others debated, I will, I will examine the history of this architectural commission in light of the adjournamental campaign of the PCF. Indeed, formal qualities such as transparency, sinuosity, and flexibility were transferred from architectural to political discourse and vice versa in the official campaign to promote the headquarters. The building was promoted as a transparent party, as a French architectural magazine put it, a building for which the French Communist Party had given free reign to a modern architect who was then known in France also, and I quote, as an enemy of the right angle and of capitalism. The explicit counter-reference to Le Corbusier indicated that the project represented an adjournamento or updating even for French communism. But the tension between transparency and opacity had to be negotiated not only in the realm of architecture. It would not be easy to update French communism at that point, especially without erasing certain aspects of its recent past. Indeed, the architectural venture offers an interesting perspective on this question. The assumption here is that the building stays a, is staged a disjunction between the party's will to symbolize its change or adjournamento through Nehemiah's modernism and the very status of modern architecture itself on the eve of May 68. So going back after World War II, a significant part of French society identified with the French Communist Party to the point of making it one of the strongest communist party parties in the Western world, as well as an important component of the national political and cultural spheres. However, the symbolic crisis inaugurated in 1956 by the 20th Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, often referred to as the Congress of Destalinization, imposed the need for a new legitimation of communist throughout the world, and especially in France, where the PCF was dogmatically loyal to the Kremlin regime. French communist leaders were determined to submit to Stalinist recommendations such as Danovism, a cultural policy that meant that artists, writers, and the intelligentsia in general had to conform to the party line in their creative work. For artists close to the French Communist Party, this led to the adoption of socialist realism. It took a long time for French communist leaders to recognize Stalin's crime, crimes and begin their own process of destalinization. Zdanovism and socialist realism continued to haunt the party's cultural guidelines until the early 60s. As a result, beginning in 56, the PCF gradually lost members and voters, especially among intellectuals and students, and thus its central position in French political and cultural life. And yet the discussion of the relationship between culture and ideology only took place in new terms a decade later when the French Communist Party started to distance itself from Soviet guidelines. A new official policy was announced at the party's central committee in Argenteuil, suburbs or banlieue of, of Paris, in March 1966, with the adoption of a final resolution recognizing, as I quote, for the sake of the working class, the imperative of creative freedom, by formally breaking with the notion of party art. The image to be convey, conveyed henceforth was that of, of a party of important creators such as Picasso, a party member since 1944 whose production should not conform anymore to an official cultural line. And you can see Picasso's painting here on the cover of the issue of Cahiers du Communisme. Because of his international status, Niemeyer seemed the perfect candidate to give form to the idea of a new national headquarters, which in fact already existed before the death of the EPIC's general secretary of the party, Maurice Torres, in 1964. However, the final decision to commission Niemeyer was only made by the time of this comité in Argenteuil. In 1971, when La Nouvelle Critique asked Georges Gosna, the party's treasurer, who was directly responsible for the architectural commission, whether the decision to invite Niemeyer for this venture was a remarkable illustration of Argenteuil's resolution, Gosnat agreed, stressing that the project was, in effect, its concrete application. Erecting a building is a cultural move, but since the PCF had changed, it decided, among other things, to give a new architectural physiognomy to its new mentality and its quest for adjournamento. It is no coincidence that the first issue of the new series of La Nouvelle Critique, launched in February 1967, featured Niemeyer's first sketches for the new headquarters on its cover. Both the renewal of the magazine's graphic design and content and the commissioning of the architectural project took place 
at the time of Argenteuil. La Nouvelle Critique also had to change. It should be remembered that the monthly was originally created in 1948 to spread Stalinist dogma in politics, science, and culture. And we can see here a text by Anatole Kopp who was very constrained, speaking of modern architecture and trying to cope with socialist realism at the time. This architectural commission was therefore not only a spatial but also a temporal move since the image that the PCF wanted to distance itself from was primarily that associated with the cultural policies of the year before the 1960s, with socialist realism. In this sense, Niemeyer's modern architecture served as a crucial tool. Along with Prouvé, Niemeyer was one of the few established names in modernism worldwide, especially after Le Corbusier's death in 1965. Niemeyer's nomination by the PCF at the same time, that same year of Le Corbusier's death, uh, had also a symbolic political connotation. Niemeyer was then exiled to France, or self-exiled, as he used to say, uh, because his political position was at the heart of the various problems he had with the military po police since the Brazilian coup d'état in 1964, uh, which took place four years after the inauguration of Brazilian. It was important for the PCF to associate the architecture of the new headquarters with a discourse of modernization and modernism, but this wouldn't be easy given all the ways in which Stalin's socialist realism implied the repression of the avant-garde modern architecture. It is worth recalling that the first official reaction in the Soviet Union against Stalin took place in the realm of architecture. Two years before 1956, on the occasion of Khrushchev's speech to the All-Union Conference of Buildings, Builders and Architects in Moscow, in which he condemned the excess of Stalinist buildings. In fact, for the French Communist Party, the symbolic step towards modernism took place even before Niemeyer's project was conceived with the choice of the site itself. For the PCF, the Belleville site represented an opportunity to reconcile itself with the very, very Russian modern avant-garde uh, architecture. This was emphasized in La Nouvelle Critique, special dossier in 1971, which presented the wooden Soviet pavilion designed by Russian architect Konstantin Melnikov for the International Decorative Arts Exhibition of 1925 as a precursor to Niemeyer's project, as if socialist realism had never existed and suppressed the modern avant-garde, including Melnikov himself. In fact, Stalinism made Melnikov unproductive after 1932. Built in the 8th arrondissement of Paris and dismantled after the exhibition, this pavilion, offered by the Soviet Union to the French communists, was rebuilt on the same site as the new headquarters of the PCF, the future. The Maison des Syndicats, the former owner of the site, had allowed the pavilion to be rebuilt there in the early 30s to house the first workers' university. The pavilion was demolished shortly after the liberation of Paris. And here is a pearl found... Um, in the archives of the Paris Institute of Geography, an oblique view from 1934, in which we can see, well, you won't be able to see, the Melnikov Pavilion over here. And this is the site of the uh, headquarters for the French Communist Party. The uh, Workers' University inside the pavilion was actually the venue of the famous surrealist exhibition La Vérité sur les Colonies, an anti-imperialist show produced during the rise of fascism in France. So the new site uh, of, the, of the headquarters ultimately promoted the reconciliation between the party and its revolutionary past. However, by using the new headquarters to rewrite its own history while omitting the fate of the modern avant-garde in the Soviet Union, and communist counter-revolutionary politics, the PCF strategy was not fully effective. Despite the PCF's modernizing campaign, populist premises that had once served to situate socialist realist aesthetics in a revolutionary context saturated both the form and content of this publication. The magazine demagogically addressed the location, construction, and architecture of the new headquarters. This was... Um, an illustration, uh, this was illustrated by images of Belleville's miserable population, emotional testimonials from the construction workers, and the didactic three-page color comic-like drawing of the undulating main panel reflecting both clouds and trees. In fact, Niemeyer was given full freedom to develop this project, which consisted of this lab that would house the party's administration and the underground facilities that would make up the main entrance to the headquarters, which was christened the foyer of the working class, because it would host party members in its exhibition rooms and conference hall under a dome. 
In French, the subsoil and base of a building is usually referred to as the infrastructure, and everything above is a superstructure. And in the development of Niemeyer's design for the PCF headquarters, this widely used term seem to, seem to have embodied the Marx, Marxist theory that separate the forces and bases of production, infrastructure, from the ideological and symbolic dimension of society, superstructure. Uh, the vestiges of the past to be raised also persisted in the spatial division of the superstructure. As a journalist from Le Batiment suggested in 1971, in addition to the first level of the slab, reserved for a documentation center and library, and the sixth floor for a restaurant, each of the four office levels was organized according to a design that, and I quote, was not the order of the day. Instead of using the landscape offices that were in vogue at the time, which Niemeyer had designed for most of the buildings in Brasilia. He had to design wind in central corridors on most of the floors with offices firmly divided on both sides by mocha panels that allowed their occupants a certain amount of privacy. This bureaucratic disposition was not in keeping with the party's praise of transparency, but with its very cult of secrecy, a legacy of the Stalinist years. The building was still advertised as a house of glass, which was actually a paradoxical metaphor as the history of architecture attests. Transparency has also served as a symbolic disguise for opaque politics. And I remind you that Tirani's Casa del Fascio, for example, was also conceived as a house of glass. A literal translation of Mussolini's motto, fascism, is a glass house into which everyone should be able to look. But the PCF's new headquarters was indeed an exceptional undertaking in the history of 20th century French political culture, and ultimately in the general history of political parties operating under free electoral conditions. It represented the acceptance of two risks. The first is the political risk of not being re-elected. This happened to the PCF in the 16, 1968 legislative elections, when the party lost 40 seats. This election is the backbone for the public financing of political parties. As a result, the party could not complete the construction of the uh, slab until 1971. Despite Nehemiah's objections, as we can see in a letter he wrote to Georges Gosnat, the party's treasurer, pleading for the rational completion of the work in reinforced concrete, the headquarters had to be built in two phases, the second of which only began in 1979 and was completing, completed in 1980. When his appeal failed, Niemeyer finally asked Gosna to help him win public contracts in France until he could complete the PCF headquarters project. Gosna accepted the deal and tried to create the necessary conditions through so-called municipal communism. So this was the origin of Niemeyer's party's office, the subject of the book I published in France on what Niemeyer himself called his voluntary exile. The other risk is ideological or the fact that architecture persists even when mentalities change. This is perfectly illustrated by Niemeyer's headquarters. One of the first changes to the project occurred immediately after the events of May 68, which challenged all ideologies from Gaullism to communism and convinced the party leadership of the risk of insurrection. So they feared gas attacks and they demanded openings in the curtain wall of the headquarters. And with the support of Niemeyer, De Roche and Shemetov, Prouvé was commissioned to design the curtain wall. Through a series of studies developed with his collaborators, Prouvé devised an ingenious locking system based on an aluminum bar in tension and an ergonomically designed handle. The system consists of openings located every three panels, which are barely noticeable when closed. The incompleteness of the project was another sign of ideological risk. In fact, the image that its incompleteness ultimately evoked throughout the 70s echoed the party's own parallel political inconsistencies and consequent gradual decay. It stood as an avatar of the party's own situation after May 68, when they did not support the communist student and worker uprisings and became the mainstream of the French left. As a result, the new headquarters remained for 10 years without its fluidly organized foyer of the working class, the very infrastructure of the building. Conceived as a kind of insignia of the PCF self-criticism and adjournamento, the building was still under construction when in 1977, the party line hardened, hardened again into a new policy of conciliation with the Soviet Union, leading to the support of its invasion of Afghanistan in 1979. 
After 68, however, it was not only communism that was difficult to support, but also modern architecture. In a sense, the two were often equated in the new architectural debates that pervaded the newly created school of architecture that replaced the Ecole des Beaux-Arts after May 68. The 70s in France saw an ongoing turn to postmodernism, in the name of which, in the words of French philosopher Jean-François Lyotard, architects, and I quote, sought to get rid of the Bauhaus project, throwing out the baby of experimentation with the bathwater of functionalism, end of quote. In this context, Niemeyer's building embodied an easy object of criticism and was thrown out alongside with this water, regardless of any kind of architectural qualities and innovations that the building had. Even its original oblique spaces, then under construction, did not prevent the negative criticism of a number of architects from different generations, such as Ionel Schein, who together with his friend Claude Parent, was the architect of the oblique in France. Schein objected to what he saw as a formalist architectural object. In Camarade de Niemeyer, an article published in a daily combat, in 1973, Schein put it, and I quote, the PCF's building in Paris is qualified as new. It is only new for its age. If Nehemiah had built a Rothschild bank, would he have produced a different architecture, this brave communist? Like all the architects of my generation, I admire Nehemiah with conviction and enthusiasm. But this wonderful wine of the best vintage disappointed, it did not age well. Nehemiah lost contact with his own time and with himself. Well, he would barely know that Nehemiah lived 106 years, so he would live many more decades uh, and he would age even more. Before the battle between modernists and postmodernists, which in France encompassed the decline of communism, it is difficult to define whether the new headquarters was a project of its time, just as it is difficult to understand the amplitudes and limits of a transformation in the realms of politics. It may have been too late to design a manifesto for modern architecture, as Jean Desroches, one of Niemeyer's collaborators on the project, put it, just as it may have been too late for the PCF to change. So to return to the original question, is Niemeyer's headquarters for the French Communist Party itself political? Does architecture speak politically? Analyzed against the backdrop of the theoretical debates, publications, events, and living memory associated with it, the building reveals a political history in which culture and politics were intertwined. The political maneuvers of the French Communist Party in relation to these cultural projects are certainly open to different interpretations, and the same could be said of the architecture of the new headquarters. In fact, architecture inhabits certain notions of time, whether revolutionary, revisionist, reactionary, anachronistic, of, or avant-garde, Nehemiah's modern building seems capable of occupying all five categories, each representing different temporal relationships, as if its mirrored facade could bend different temporalities. As a testimony to one of the party's forms, giving over to its will to change, the building today seems finally to be respected as a chef d'oeuvre, a masterpiece, or even a la mode. Gone are the days of an active French Communist Party, a testimony to a bygone era. Never again was the PCF the political and cultural force it was before 1981 presidential elections, which marked the final stage of its irreversible decline. This decline was completed with the collapse of the Soviet world in the following years. It is worth recalling Walter Benjamin's analysis of 19th century Paris, in which he emphasized how the development of the forces of production had reduced the symbols of desire of the previous century to rubble, even before the monuments they represented had crumbled. Communism can no longer fulfill the idea of a new society, and yet some of its landmarks, such as the national headquarters, seem to function more as a portable or pré-apporter backdrop that could stage several political ideologies, even their dressing up their absence. Today, the PCF has been reduced to a sect, and it is hard to imagine the daily going-ons behind Prouvé's curtain wall, originally de designed or a, to, a, to avoid broken reflection, as a journalist has stressed in 1971. And uh, many people uh, know and photograph uh, the PCF headquarters from the outside, which is, as we say, highly Instagrammable, but its history is surprisingly overlooked by scholars and even aficionados, 
not to mention its global Cold War history between France, Cuba, Brazil, Algeria, Hungary, and the former Soviet Union. So to satisfy your curiosity, here are some photographs of the secret daily life uh, in the offices of the still existing French Communist Party. So I'll go through some of these pictures. And they were, um, I commissioned these photographs for two of my books from the architect and photographer Ciro Miguel, who's a longtime friend and collaborator. Um, and they, these pictures were taken not so long ago, in 2021. And we can clearly see the facade uh, designed by Jean Prouvé. Well, thank you for bearing with me through this lecture. <laughs> Yes, if there are. A lot of things happening. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering if the flow of, of, of the movement, yeah. if it were kind of happening in parallel or one was leading the other. Yeah, I feel like, uh, well, the, the French Communist Party even took longer, I would say, than, you know, uh, the Soviet world to get rid of uh, that reference. Um, but as I show in my book, uh, well, there are some architects who are trying to kind of concile modernism and socialist realism. One of them is André Lursa, and he's a kind of father figure for the generation that I look into, especially in the 50s. Uh, he was, a, of course, uh, enemy number one of Le Corbusier, and he was trying to, uh, you know, um, combine modernism and socialist realism. The generation that I uh, uh, deal with, uh, which, because I really look into kind of uh, how they uh, be get formed as a kind of generation during the Beaux-Arts in the 50s, uh, they were not as constrained in terms of architecture, but in terms of the, 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 the debates, the cultural debates, so they were, in a way, architects were less uh, constrained than the artists that were close to the party. Uh, but they still had to cope with that discourse. And Anatole Kopp, for example, you know, who became, uh, well, I think many of you know his work. I mean, the, he's really like the first to disseminate, uh, even at the AA, uh, he was uh, running some summer sessions in the 70s about, uh, dedicated to the, to the Western, uh, well, the Western dissemination of the Soviet avant-garde, the Russian avant-garde. Um, they were, uh, you know, he was trying to uh, deal with uh, uh, the legacy of socialist realism and how modern architects could cope with it. But of course, after the 60s and the generation I look into, they were the ones who were trying to open a new path and get rid of their, that discourse uh, and come up with an architecture that was in fact not, not so much addressing socialist realism, but modernism itself, because modernism became the staple of gullism. So these architects were really on the one hand, trying to get rid of that theoretical debate of socialist realism and trying to do something different than what the goal was doing because they thought that modernism was being betrayed. So very early on, they were against the Grands Ensemble, for example. They would not design you know, mass housing. They were trying to do something else, even though in the end, their projects were um, somehow judged in the same terms because modernism became a monolithic thing in France uh, you know, after 68. So the, 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 the headquarters for the French Communist Party is something, it's a project that is interesting because it took so long to finish. So it's a project from 65, one year after Brasilia, but it was completed, you know, when Mitterrand was elected. So it's, uh, it's you know, architecture has uh, uh, this uh, temporality that is, uh, you know, mentalities change, things change, and the buildings are still uh, being erected. So it's very interesting to see the kind of political zigzag because the party in the late 70s became closer to the Soviet Union and, 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 and went back to a kind of Stalinist um, endeavor, and the building was still being erected. And the French communists chose, um, you know, Nehemiah in a moment when actually modernism was put into crisis in France. So that generation who worked with Nehemiah was trying to defend and say that the building was uh, new brutalism, for example. So it's, uh, you know, uh, kind of like trying to uh, promote the newness of the building, but it was to change, uh, too, too late to actually promote a modern uh, building of that kind. Yes. 
Thank you, Vanessa, for an amazing lecture, for the generosity of putting my uh, small project there. Uh, I want to ask you to comment on another angle of this building. Uh, we teach architectural history, uh, and especially in the 20th century, we teach about hundreds of European architects yeah. who left Europe and came and did amazing buildings in the Americas. There are very, very few that were able to do the reverse route. Yeah. Uh, architects from the Americas who did amazing buildings in Europe. Uh, this is one of them. I, I think it's the first very important building. The other is the Sainsbury Wing of the National Gallery by Denise Scott Brown and Bob Venturi, which was very much discussed last year because this year because of the renovation. Uh, I want you to comment on that angle, yeah. the importance of this building, because it's by an architect from the Americas who had the opportunity to build a very important building in Europe. Yes, I think it's a... I think Niemeyer was very... Um, he was supported by... I think the international career of Niemeyer is highly indebted to L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui and André Bloch. So um, when Niemeyer was... Uh, in, in the, well, when the coup d'etat took place in Brazil, Niemeyer was already uh, in, in Europe. He was in Portugal and he was seeking, uh, you know, international commissions he had designed uh, in, um, in uh, Germany, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the housing project. So, indeed, I mean, he's a... Uh, He's very unique, and I think his his career is really bound to France. I mean, there is a French, uh, you know, connection that really supported his work. The only thing that I would like to add to your, uh, well, that kind of like, which is the argument of my chapter, is that um, the status of Niemeyer by the time he, you know, he designed this building was not the same as he had, for example, in the 40s. And I think your question is also very good because in terms of socialist realism, Jean Desroches, you know, who was one of the architects of... Uh, of the group, uh, because it's a very select, uh, restricted group of architects that I look into. There were many communist architects who were just doing the same architecture as the ones working for the Gul, for the ZOOP, for the Zona Urbanité, uh, Urbanisée en Priorité, for the mass projects. These architects that I look are very different because they're trying to do something else, really to kind of convey the language of the adjournment of the French Communist Party. But they explained to me that in the 40s, Niemeyer actually was a perfect compromise uh, between, uh, of socialist realism because he was um, national in form and international in content, which is the motto of uh, socialist realism. So they would stick to Nehemiah as a say, look, there is a path you know, that is not fully socialist realism. It's a modern path, but it's in response to the aspiration of socialist realism. And Ben Archumi, for example, when he did the architecture review issue uh, in the 70s on the Beaux-Arts, uh, on the Col de Beaux-Arts, uh, you know, at the height of uh, postmodernism, he said that in the 40s, Niemeyer's projects were copied by all the Beaux-Arts students and all the Hondu, you know, the renders, they were copying, especially um, uh, pr projects before Brasilia. Like I would say Pampulia is really like the project that students were copying. But by the time he designed the, you know, the, the headquarter for the PCF, this is the beginning of, of the end of his, uh, you know, his status. And it's interesting to, I feel like, uh, you know, when we look into Nehemiah, we don't have this, this uh, legibility, but because he had a career in France, it's interesting to understand the reception of his work, how it changed. So when he arrived, he was the architect of Brasilia, but then with the coup d'etat, you know, and he was promoting himself as a, an architect who was being chased by the dictatorship. So there was a kind of tiers mondisme, you know, an interest in the third world in France at the time because of Cuba and, you know, and uh, he actually incarnated that, uh, very briefly, uh, because we know that at the time he arrived there, he, he couldn't design his airport for Brasilia, right? So he was talking about this all over and over. But we also know that in the 70s, he kept designing for the military in Brazil. So he had a very special status in Brazil as well, because I feel like he couldn't be touched by the dictatorship because he had this international status. So you're fully right to point that he's one of the few but I do problematize a little bit or complicate a little bit the reception of his work in France where he had a career uh, because he moved to France and uh, he had an office in France and we know very little about it. And all he designed many housing projects for French municipalities and they were all actually blocked um, in the 70s because they were uh, received as grands ensembles. They were, you know, and there was a... Uh, 
uh, a law that was they, that passed to kind of fight the social turmoil that the Grands Ensemble came to incarnate. And they would say, even though they were not designed, you know, as the repetitive, you know, uh, projects of the 50s, uh, Niemeyer's project didn't pass. So his reception was more complex than that, but indeed he has a very special, I feel, career path than um, any other, well, from Brazil, you know, Paulo Mendes da Rocha, for example, who is also another Pritzker Prize, and I don't like to talk in terms of Pritzker Prize, which is not a, you know, but just to speak the language of the Pritzker Prize, you know, he doesn't have the same um, global, um, you know, the, the, his work is not so globally disseminated. But the one thing that is, strikes is, you know, for when I started studying this building, which was really like what made me, well, ask, what, was there, a, you know, there are many works about the lawyers were close to the French Communist Party or the artists were close to, and there was a group of architects around the Communist Party and they were so active in the banlieue in the outskirts of, of Paris. So, but this was the first paper I wrote about this building, but there are absolutely no right, no one wrote about this building, which is so strange because everybody I was talking to, Annette, everybody loves this building, knows this building, and no one studied it. Are you, yes. No, I'm just looking very interested. <laughs> Ariel has a question. Yes. Hi, uh, thank you, Vanessa. Um, I guess a slightly more abstract question, but if to like the question in this example of can architecture be political or is the relationship between politics and architecture, and your answer is yes, but non specific, right? It, it can be it can be political, but it can be many different politics. Um, so I suppose the question is even if we have these architects who are actively trying to do communist architecture in innovative and in, in interesting ways, creating works that can be through the projection of individual po uh, politics very different from communist, or even your comparison of, with Tarani and, and other sort of, I mean, like we talk about modernism and communism, we talk about modernism and fashion, we talk about modernism and democracy, like all you can, you can do the, the bridge to everything. So if architecture is, finds it very difficult to hold the party line, as it were. Um, what, is, what, 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 is, what is the role of the architect then in that conversation? If, if the building can be political but non-specific, so where does politics or how does it work? Where does it belong in institutions like these when we are in the role of designing buildings potentially with political ideologies or, or, or not, but without that control of it, that, that being the end product? That is a very difficult question, but thank you for it. Um, that is actually the topic of the book. I mean, really trying to understand how, you know, communism in France was not only, and I think in general, uh, it's, there's also a cultural component to it. So they, these architects really struggled to come up with, uh, you know, architectures that would uh, incarnate uh, some, a certain uh, sociability, lifestyle, especially in the banlieue. If you go to the banlieue of Paris, and I think Ivry-sur-Seine, I spoke about it uh, in the spring when I came, give a lecture, you know, it's uh, considered to be the capital of French company. They still elect French mayors to this day. And uh, they really try to uh, cater for a uh, you know, the way the working class would relate, uh, and especially with uh, very important programs for the youth, uh, uh, friend, um, vacation colonies they would design, you know, in the rural parts of France or in the beach. So there was a kind of like, um, you know, an enhanced sociability, uh, an interaction between workers. So they were really working closely with mayors, and they were really trying to fight the way uh, the politics of the Gaulle you know, uh, with, who urbanized France, uh, you know, deeply in the 60s, uh, was not so careful about the cities in the outskirts, which were really the kind of red, you know, um, bastion of the French Communist Party. So they were really trying to fight, you know, there were like roads that were open, disrupting, you know, the, the kind of uh, public spaces or, you know, existing monuments. So there is a kind of ongoing, um, uh, task force uh, and, and these architects, but they were they were they wanted to um, open up the party to like a more um, you know a less uh, sect like uh, you know conversation that French communists were very uh, they were really uh, considered to be revolutionary after World War II because they fought uh, you know they were the resistance in France was highly connected to the French so they fought with the Nazis and uh, but after that you know after what happened in the Soviet Union and Stalin of course they became the reactionary of the left 
So these architects, other than uh, you know trying to fight the kind of urbanizing campaigns of the Gaulle, who were disrupt, which were disrupting you know the the, the, con the constituency of the French Communist Party, they also were trying to create a language and uh, you know uh, a discourse. Uh, or trying to engage with uh, philosophers. For example, Althusser really inspired Jean Renaudy. Althusser wanted to update Marxism. Renaudy wanted to also, he would say, Marxism, the late Marxist is a, the posthumanist Marxist is a science. And Jean Renaudy was, was trying to develop a kind of ar architectural Althusserianism. So there was a kind of conversation with all of those philosophers and think thinkers who were trying to update uh, communism, open it up to society, try to compromise some of its dogmas, and they were trying to do that through architecture. So I have different chapters, of course, that explain that, uh, you know, that kind of, um, that agenda, and it was not easy, of course, because then they, they themselves, for example, the IUA constituted themselves as a cooperative and not as a, you know, as one of the big offices who were working for the goal. So it's a, it's a, the way they organized themselves as a practice, they went, they conceived some uh, facilities, housing for them was not only a techno-political program, but also a culturally significant one. So I feel like they were trying to really uh, engage with that cultural movement. If they were effective or not, this is really up for debate because I think, as you say, it's, uh, it's not so easy. I'm not sure if I answer your question, but uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Vanessa. I, I think you articulated so many of the bewilderments uh, that we all have in the search for what means what and how to use uh, some language for some kind of intent uh, and the kind of um, elusiveness of that. Uh, I, and I certainly appreciate the discussion on transparency. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, you know, it's... You know, I, I wonder if we, we try so much to find that in uh, singular building language. Uh, I, I wonder if you could share your thoughts. I, I think especially Niemeyer has so much potential to be discussed urbanistically as well as singular building. Uh, and in, in many ways, that seems to be more open to an interpretation of any kind of politic. Uh, because of the kind of wide range of um, accessibilities, uh, uh, relationships that an urban domain uh, answers to these kinds of questions. Could you talk about that a bit? In terms of the urban dimension of his architecture? Uh, any architecture. Because I think, you know, as you search for a language that is embodied in a singular building, uh, I, I think you end up where we all end up, like, uh, how can one curved glass facade mean all of these things yeah well it can't yeah it can't so so what can so what can uh, how, how do we how do we begin to identify these these uh, moments uh, it's a difficult question but I yeah. feel like I'm not looking to this com this commission is part as I say of like a movement and a and a and a um a collaboration between a group of architects and and uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and the party. So, I I look into this commission as part of of this like long story because it it's not uh, you know look it's I'm not looking context. at it yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a it's really part of this as I said conversation about you know what was going on in the Beaulieu and this is really the the monument that they made. Uh, you know, in Paris uh, at the time, because none of those architects would have access to, you know, big commissions at the time. So this commission, and actually relates to your, your work, because all these architects were designing in the banlieue, and then when Mitterrand is elected, you know, and they kind of like open up, and they are so disappointed with the French Communist Party, they actually have the chance to design for Mitterrand the Grand Projet, for example, Paul Chemetov, who designed the Minister of Finance. So this project is very symbolic for them because it's a moment when they have the chance to design a building in Paris. So it's a monument to communism, but communism was not taking place in Paris. Communism was taking place in the outskirts, in the banlieue. And that, that is where they actually had a discourse about urbanism, because they were really trying to work at the scale of the city and not at the scale of, uh, let's say, the, the Zoop, for example, you know, the, the, the big uh, housing projects that would have absolutely no regard, uh, you know, no concern for uh, the street. Or So they were actually having this discourse, the return to the city that, you know, postmodernism actually articulated. These architects, in a way, they were 
they had the same discourse uh, avant la lettre, you know, because they were working in cities and they wanted to keep those cities what they were, uh, because they were common, they were uh, bastions of communism since the 20s. So they were very concerned about the, the street and an architecture that doesn't neglect, you know, the street uh, and the square. Uh, in a way, all the kind of discourse of postmodernism was a bit anticipated by these architects. They were really thinking through, uh, you know, urbanism and and many of their projects actually incarnated, uh, you know, this concern for uh, the city itself uh, before. So that's uh, it's very interesting to look Super into, interesting. you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. this cohort uh, and and the way they were also very open to um, postmodernism, uh, trying to, uh, co you know, promote modernism, but in a way that would also incorporate the criticism. Mm -hmm. And in France, what is very interesting that is that postmodernism is related to the left-wing uh, you know, the new socialists. Unlike, you know, more, normally we associate postmodernism with a more reactionary discourse of the right wing, for example. But in France, it was highly uh, related to the uh, destruction of the Beaux-Arts system and uh, the questioning of, uh, of communism, actually, you know, the left wing politics. So the right to the city was uh, what actually paved the way for postmodernism. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but you I did actually. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay. Hi, that was great. Uh, also seeing photos from inside. Um, I just wanted to go back to a question um, in regards to America and, and Europe. Um, because, it, and also because, you know, in a way, I mean, even communism appears as a filter, um, the architectural styles are many that uh, filter through that. So, and that you have brutalism, you have modernism. Yeah. Um, so, in a way, Niemeyer uh, is some kind of version of that. So, um, I'm from Argentina. Uh, in 1929, you know, Le Corbusier, in this kind of, what, what, what is the value of the, the kind of transatlantic yeah. <laughs> exchange? And in 1929, Le Corbusier comes to, invited by somebody in Argentina, but then he goes, you know, he does that tour yeah. through America, yes. uh, stopping in Brazil as well, in Buenos Aires and Brazil. And what he does is like he brings international style. It's not that it was not known. And so it's strange to see, and I don't, you know, similarly Brazil, similarly Argentina, the international style becomes the national style. Yeah. Um, and, and so, but, but it's not national. I mean, it's like, I mean, it's still national style. The international style, modernism is still a national style of some South American countries. But, but I think that what many things that you said about Niemeyer, for me seeing it from down there, Niemeyer is unique. He takes the, the international style and makes it different, starting in Pampula and so on. So, and many things you start to see, um, there's... The feedback also from Brazilian architects, you know, uh, Costa, you know, many that influenced Le Corbusier to some of his later work as well. So in, in a way, it's almost, where are they original? <laughs> it's like, so in a way, he, he may goes back to Europe to kind of, I don't know, go back to Europe to see again what he received earlier on to a style that was already European. Uh, and so it's filtered through Brazilian culture and goes back to Europe and then back. But yet, w where does it belong? So uh, in, in a way, the kind of the world is a melting pot <laughs> at that point. Uh, and then it starts to mix with everything else, you know, terminology, brutalism as a, as a terminology, pure terminology and criticism um, through Barn Barnham. But I... So, so, I, my, my, I mean, maybe I don't have a question. I'm just saying that, that it's, 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 it's the complexities of the styles um, that in a way the uniqueness, I would say, maybe is in the collaboration, maybe it's the courting wall. I mean, where the uniqueness that start to appear from that early international style or, or the basis of modernism that travels through the world back and forth? Um. I think Neymar really shook the international community so much with what he did, you know, uh, since the first collaboration with uh, uh, 
Le Corbusier and I mean, Fernando, if you want to jump in, uh, please feel free. Uh, and of course we have, you know, I think that Brazil entered the world map of modernism highly through, you know, not, he was not the only one, but what he did. So Brazil builds and of course, you know, all the, I feel like people, you know, the international community started to look uh, to Brazil highly thanks to what he did, which was not always very well received. Max Bill, for example, would, you know, uh, in 54, he went to Brazil and said, well, Niemeyer is a formalist. What are you doing here in this country, you know, with this sinuous architecture? And there was a huge debate with Lucio Costa. So, you know, he, the reception of his work has always been problematic. Uh, I'm not sure what is original or not original. I know that he actually made an imprint into modernism uh, and transformed into something else. Uh, so that international style, as you say, became something else, and he was not the only one for sure, but he's one of the main, uh, uh, I would say, uh, you know, uh, uh, figures that actually, you know, transformed modernism into something else uh, in Latin America. Uh, but this building, uh, it is an interesting building uh, because it's at the confluence of different temporalities and narratives. And I wouldn't say Niemeyer is a brutalist, but that's how they advertise, because the generation that collaborated with Niemeyer wanted to actually... Um, defend the building that was already attacked when it was inaugurated. So they were saying, well, you know, because this is, uh, this is not a white building of Neymar, this is a concrete building and uh, it, there is a rough, uh, you know, uh, uh, texture to it that is very unique. So I feel like there is a kind of contribution of Chemetov, De Roche, and even Jean Prouvé, you know, this is a different building, but it's one that is at the confluence of, of, of a big, um, uh, economy of symbols, I would say, you know, this is why I find it fascinating. I, Neymar is not a socialist realist architect or a brutalist architect, but I feel like it, it, this building had a very complex reception because of the moment it was built, because of the things that was happening, uh, that were happening, you know, in the world in terms of the own status of Neymar that we normally don't really know uh, in Brazil. We don't really study, uh, you know, this reception, uh, you know, and up until we do know about Brazil built. But what in the 70s, you know, when he, go, uh, he goes to Europe and start building uh, in a moment when postmodernism is ri rising, we barely know. But yeah, his buildings started to really be like attacked. Um, even the Mondadori, I mean, Bernard Huet, uh, who was the editor-in-chief of L'Architecture Aujourd'hui, attacked the building, saying, well, you know, he's now designing palaces. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, uh, but I feel like what I'm very interested in is the way his, his status and also how he was designing for the French Communist Party, for Renault, and for Algeria, and these were all conflicting ideologies in a way. So the, you know, and these are, you know, this is what also what are, you know, what Le Corbusier would do too. He designed for Vichy, uh, he designed for Stalin, uh, he designed, uh, you know, uh, for left to right. Um, and so, yeah, the question is if architecture is political, uh, it depends, but for sure, these architects were trying to promote, um, you know, this architecture within a certain uh, language and discourse and uh, cultural, um, I would say, movements. I know many questions, <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm just going to keep it short. Thank you so much uh, for an amazing lecture. Uh, I, I learned a lot. Um, I'm, I was just wondering about the sort of social realism versus abstraction conversation that in the art world was really important yes. in regard to propaganda after the Second World War. Yep. I mean, you know, like, I don't know, the CIA propping up um, abstract uh, expressionism in yep. Europe as sort of an anti-movement uh, to socialist realism. Yep. Um, two completely different, let's say, formal projects, um, but both basically instrumentalized toward a political propagandist yep. goal. And I was wondering if there is a sort of a parallel or relationship to... Um, you know, the, the the building you were talking about, the headquarters, um, because it seems to me uh, outwardly, I heard a lot of, you know, kind of talk about the social realist aspects and so forth in 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 the presentation. But is there is there in architecture is similarly clear cut um, formal categorization as there is in art, for instance? There were, well, as I said, the work of André Lursa was really, uh, you know, he was really uh, trying to uh, c 
come up with a solution. I mean, he was still a modern architect, but was still trying to learn from the whole debate about socialist realism, representation, you know, even historicism. Uh, well, Jean-Louis Cohen did a, a book, I think it was his, it was his doctoral dissertation about André Lursa, uh, it's called André Lursa, l'autocritique d'un moderne. And the autocriticism is something that is very common in communism. Uh, when you, you know, you do something wrong against the party, you have a self-autocritique. And the title of this work, Autocritique d'un moderne, is because he was really trying to, um, yeah, cope with the, the debate on socialist realism, but still being a modern architect. Uh, the French Communist Party, what is interesting is that at the time it was commissioned, this is the moment when the party wanted to get rid of that whole, you know, but it was very recent because they were still, like, the artists were still, you know, very much in that register of, uh, and the, 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 the writers too, because there was also, socialist realism is a debate in literature first, right? Um, and so Aragon, for example, who was a poet and a member of uh, the Communist Party, he was still writing novels that were kind of in line with the debate on socialist realism uh, and the painters too. The architects, as I say, André Lourcine, there are other architects in the banlieue who were trying to come up with, uh, you know, there is a building, uh, the Cité Maurice Torres, which is named after the Secretary General of the French Communist Party. It's kind of, it looks like a Stalinist building in Ivry. The architects are, I'm interested in, they were trying to break with that. Uh, and so, but what is interesting is that the party had just tried to get rid of that reference. And what I find interesting is that when they promoted the building, because it was in the same site where the Meonikov Pavilion was, they, they, they said, well, this is a precursor for the building, you know, the modern avant-garde. But actually, very, until very recently, you know, they were uh, rejecting that avant-garde and, uh, you know, uh, promoting socialist realism. But the kind of architecture that the, 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 the architects are looking to uh, our design is not, I mean, they really want to break with socialist realism. But when they were at the Bozat, that was the conversation that was taking place, um, the conversation about representation. And I find it interesting because someone like, um, I don't know if you know him, Villanova Artigas in, in uh, you know, in, in Sao Paulo. I mean, I wrote, a, 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 you know, he was really... Um, part of this whole debate about socialist realism. Uh, he was part of a magazine. And I do feel that he was, uh, he was a member of the Brazilian Communist Party, but very different than Danny Meyer, much more serious in terms of his engagement with, you know. And I would argue that that was, you know, the kind of topic of my paper that, um, you know, he was not, he was influenced by this idea of, uh, you know, um, uh, representation and communicating with the masses and I would say that his structures are very bold and you know even bolder than they should be to me you know it, there is an influence about that whole conversation in the architecture that he did so it's not that he's a socialist realist architect but he was very much embedded in that conversation which is a very interesting one you know abstraction versus and there is a turn in his work where he, you know, his, he becomes, he rejected abstraction. He wrote against it, Villanova Artigas. He has uh, texts, which is very interesting because he was a modern architect, but he was, there were exhibitions in Sao Paulo about uh, abstract art and he wrote against it. And then there was a moment in which he became critical of his own, you know, attitude and actually started to condemn socialist realism. But to me, the conversation somehow had an imprint in the kind of architecture he designed. I, don't, I wouldn't say so for Niemeyer uh, and for the generation I'm looking to. I'm just saying that the party was trying to get rid of that reference right. and uh, that, that, are, that somehow, you know, the, 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 the headquarters was an important uh, symbol. No more questions? Thank you.